um, it's it's always like I don't know how is it for other artists, but very often we hear this like similar um, stories. I was in a high school in um, medicine for nurses, and that was like kind of a wish of my parents because in the time of what Kosovo was going on in nineties. Um, there was a lot of question, existential questions because of the war and, you know, and um, and they always thought first, if you do the high school and it's something that is already in itself a bit of profession that could give you a job like nurse, but then you can do whatever, you can continue becoming a doctor with your studies or you can go further, but they thought they would give me this entry. And uh, I was very bad on it, so my grades were awful. And, but all my friends always directed to me and said, if we see you somewhere one day, we see you in the visual art, you know, being a painter or whatever. So even that I didn't dare at that time to say it loud by myself, it was friends who were kind of making it, you know, obvious. And when time came to, to study, I, uh, I told my parents that I'm going to study art and apply for Art Academy. It, they were really disappointed. And so in that case, I had to kind of convince them that I'm, I'm serious about this. That's not a joke. And this is not just like out of like interest of being, you know, doing something else against their will. But it's more like it's the only thing I know to do it better than other things. So. Uh, I felt also vulnerable in front of them in a way like let me do what I think I'm good and if anything else you might direct me I might fail so that's how it started and, um, and then going to academy also my first encounter with going to museum or uh, gallery or stuff there was really at that time when I start studying art so um, everything was just like beginning uh, together uh, it's very tricky, I must say it changed a lot by timing, but I would say it's a little bit like um, you never, you're never enough um, European, you're never enough exotic for Europeans and still you're never European enough, so that's how I would put it. I think the turning points in my research happened mostly with my work um, between 2012 and 2014, uh, where I was finishing this, in the process of finishing Städel Schule in Frankfurt, the studies there, entering the PhD program of artist, uh, PhD in practice in Vienna, and also preparing my solo show uh, for Mumok Museum in Vienna. So those, this kind of years, I think, made a quite a turn and was mostly focused with the works. I see a face, do you see a face? I miss you, I miss you till I don't miss you anymore. And also the barriers, uh, the, the untitled uh, military barriers, what are used as a reference from United Nations and Kosovo. So basically, this was a time or a moment when I tried also to make a crossroad between the, aesthetic, the politics of aesthetics and the common image, the abstraction between these two and the dialogue between these two. And yeah, so I would say that that made a turning point, that period. In 2007, I did a in intervention, illegal intervention, in the National Gallery in Kosovo, where I basically responded to the to the discourse at that time, which was mostly circulating around the art scene between the art peers and different people, which really mattered. Their opinion matters to me at that time, where they basically stated that we in Kosovo don't have a woman artist internationally successful and known because they just basically don't have balls. So of course that, that, that tells a lot because it shows already that as a statement means Kosovo seen at that time was quite strongly dominated by the male presence. 
and artists who were successful. So in, in, in this case, I thought and felt the urge to respond to that statement. And I thought the Muslim Muliji Art Prize, which was the big prize at that time in National Gallery, would be the right platform. So I, an opening ceremony of the prize, I buy a lot of bully balls, like from animal and testicles. And then I decide to go inside while, while the speech is happening. So I enter in, leave the balls as a kind of a gift and go out. So it was that kind of simple gesture, going in, leave the post and go out. A lot of people also criticize it, why you didn't do it this way or that way after it was done. But for me it was very important that this gesture is very simple and it's not um, violent and it's not like anything but just a subtle gesture of responding towards. Of course, this work would, wouldn't make sense today much or meaning if I wouldn't pursue my career to this degree where I am today and what I do. So it wouldn't be, uh, stay on me. And that was haunting me because I never wanted this to be just one hit wonder, making a statement but not being able to prove that also that st statement stands for itself. So yeah, that made the first shift at that time in conversation of gender issues and representation and also it was considered to be the first illegal intervention in a white cube meaning institution level in the history of art in Kosovo. It was interesting, uh, the, the feedback was um, all kind uh, in this kind of case. It was the time when the internet was really not yet as, as established as today, you can imagine it's 12, 13 years ago. And um, so there were like these online forums and somebody dropped this as a kind of information that happened. And then there were like all people from all around the world uh, debating about if it's a good or bad artwork or good gesture or intervention or what does it mean and blah blah and so somebody told me it's happening online and so I went on the internet and I found it and I was like oh my god that's shocking how to handle this kind of criticisms and then it was a lot about also the media reacted like uh, national and local and like from TV to journalism and they, many of them also are art critics they they told me, oh, so you, you really provoked with this, you know, you like to provoke. And I was like, no, 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 I never, never thought to provoke. I was the one who was provoked. So it was not the intention to provoke you. It was for me important that I respond towards those provocations that were already there. And so if my response always provokes you after then it's something else, that's another story, you can respond back to me. But I didn't have that intention to provoke you, the provocation was on the ground level already. So yeah, that may be shortly to explain how, how interesting was this shift between. The, the work Luminous, uh, Luminous Gardens, um, it's um, I have always seen that as a kind of starting, not really starting point, maybe as the next level of continuation of my work or trying to respond to the, um, to the identity construction that was very present in the time of Kosovo after the war and how the, this period of nation building state changed social and political and cultural behaving, you know, towards like this um, aiming of Western democratization and so on. So Luminous Garden was one of the elements which I thought visually was so present because it was really shifting a different uh, aesthetics between the private properties and all this toolbar architecture happening after the war in Kosovo. And I was specifically looking at the guard, uh, fences which were from 50s, 70s um, and more trying to pay attention and highlight and maybe pay a certain kind of homage because they were less and less present and disappearing and being replaced by, old, by a new more neoclassical kind of style 
of Polishness of Francis, which everybody as a question for me was like, why so high right now from this low friendly fences, which were allowing that social interaction between the neighbors to neighbors were being much more, you know, um, naturally kind of developed while now everybody is just putting a really high fences and kitschy in a way and and uh, trying to 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 impress who, protecting from what, protecting whom. And so all these questions were very interesting how the that shifted, you know. And in my work and when you see that fence from this fifties, sixties, seventies aesthetic in the background of shading of color, it's almost like also as you said, isolating but at the same time creating a certain kind of horizon that it opened it up at the same at the same time. If the clouds are a way to escape the border, I'm not sure. Maybe the clouds for me it's more like to dilute dilute the borders. Right now, when I think of the clouds and um, I look at them on a the daily basis, I always think of my sculpture, which I recently just installed in Munich outdoor, and. Um, since the view of that sculpture depends a lot on the clouds relationship, the way that sculpture creates a certain relation and temporality with the clouds and the nature in the background, it affects visually a lot. So therefore, every time now, every day, when I look at the clouds and if they are there, I'm thinking how my sculpture is going to look right now. So that's created completely a different I have been always fascinated by clouds and I've done many artworks in relation to it. But now in daily basis, I'm always thinking of my sculpture in that moment. Do I believe on the blue? Um, I would say I use blue for different reasons because first of all I think blue allows you to speculate a lot and uh, blue also as a color have been gone through different meanings and metaphors through the progressive history so therefore you can have a lot of different references to it the way one could, could you know uh, bring that into a conversation and in my work the blue started more as a content and later certain point it developed into also the way of as a gesture of claiming certain kind of media uh, language and especially uh, thinking about claiming as a more western gesture what does it mean you know does it happen more from that um, history speaking um, more often from Western artists and male artists, you know. The blue, I would say, it's one of the colors that by nature is resistance to different definition, uh, definitions and limitations. So it goes well with all other claims or other kind of aesthetics what are important in, in, in my work where I want to produce opacity or detour or fluidity or liquidity or all this kind of deterritorialization or uh, deconstruction of certain kind of aesthetics. Blue can kind of create certain um, uh, crossroad between many of those boundaries, I would say. Its urgency got lost in reverse while being in constant delay. It's a work that I started on series in 2017. And it's mostly connected to the question of can contemporary spatial information or what is present change the perception of discarded object. So when I 
encounter the dis this discarded object in um, in Kosovo in a military not in a military camp but in a certain kind of market like second secondary market which was selling the leftovers of military camp from NATO and how that object, what is hunting actually those objects. So it made me think immediately for Avery Gordon hauntology um, 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 perspective of where she says everything is haunted by the specter of something. And then in, in this case I thought what are these objects haunted the moment I find out where they're coming from, you know. And so Knowing a little bit the history of Kosovo that still doesn't have its own military, although it's independent since 2008, um, what does it mean the role of NATO at this point? NATO entered in Kosovo after the bombing in 1999 with the troops, with 50,000 troops. So you can imagine how many military camps they needed to host those troops. But today there are around 5,000 troops present still. So it reduced a lot, so it means a lot of military camps were also closed. So in this case, um, there's a lot of garbage from those camps at the same time. And so question all this kind of status quo and politics between the past and present and what does it mean the future of in this regards, um, I made, I decided to make four robots, so far they exist only three, and then basically go backward with the time frame they represent. So the first robot that I made is the last robot on the movement. So they go backward. It's urgently got lost in reverse while being in constant delay. And then it, the, it's the second and the third, but they're all in a position. Each gets more passive. So one is sitting while the other is laying down in the stomach and the other laying down on the back. So the fourth one, which is about to be produced maybe next year, is going to be even more passive than those. So it's like kind of creating time frame by frame, frame and sequence by sequence by going backward. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of performativity of time on the title because the title it says, it says it's urgency got lost in reverse while being in constant delay, which you think, okay, the urgency got lost, reverse. You know, there are so many delay, so many words which perform time in one way or another. And, um, and how do you freeze this moment, you know? Um, is it you, Joe? It's, um, one of my works, which um, I would say maybe the most um, problematic one, because there are many people who just try more and more to understand. If I bring Joe into a lecture, um, I have to give, but the whole questions always end up with, from the audience mostly about Joe, which is interesting because at the time I did Joe, I didn't take it that serious. It started the series 2015. So basically the way Joe enters in my work, and it's more as a detour. And so detour in this case is ambiguous. It pulls tricks, it eludes the, 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 the different you know, obstacles or maneuvers obstacles in, in, you know, rather than uh, confronting it directly. It fools a lot of tricks and tries to camouflage between different, you know, personas as a character. So, what is also interesting for me about the detour is that the detour in this case of spe specifically about Joe, that you can never really um, count uh, or um, make a definition of what counts as a as a failure or a success. So that's also what is interesting about Joe because I never know if Joe is really succeeding or failing what with his attempts, you know. So Joe is a kind of uh, alter ego and as a counter position in my artistic production. And it starts with a time when I got a lot of invitation when all the, the invitations start to to grow in 2015 after I represented Kosovo Pavilion in Venice Final. So 
all those invitations made me feel a bit like, oh my God, I can't handle this dynamic. This is like too fast now. Everybody wants a new artwork, a new show, new this, new that, you know. You have to come up with a lot of improvising, time production things. So, and, and, and that's where I brought Joe in because I thought Joe could be my, my joker. Joe is this white male character who is going to do things I, I don't want to compromise, so I don't want to do it. So Joe is going to do things I feel uncomfortable by myself as Flaka, you know? And so I always see Joe as more like kind of my extended arm or third leg or third eye or reserved kidney or something that Joe can mobilize constantly and be smarter and faster than me and do things what um, the kind of smooth operator or very, or he could also be super clumsy and still be excused, you know. So Joe is also a she that um, likes to be represented as a he because it's just easier, you know. So there are many things what Joe can just do it, what I can't do it. That's, and also there's a thing about so one doesn't understand if he's really stupid or just very, very good at acting stupid. I also don't know. No, 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 Joe, there's only one a relation between me and Joe that sometimes blurs when we don't know who's working for whom, when we, we don't know who made who. Is Joe making me or I'm making Joe or shaping, you know, each other? Or am I working for him or he's working for me? At this moment, I'm mostly working on wrapping up my PhD in practice because I would like to finish the dissertation upcoming year. And I'm also working on an opera project for Feshwile Bregens and Kunsthaus Bregens. It's a collaboration where I'm doing the stage design. And uh, then I'm also working for two billboards for Munich. Uh, city and commission and finishing my other sculpture which is about like last details for outdoor another sculpture outdoor for another festival I know in Brussels and some other shows and so on.